Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Christy Grimm, Director of National Programs at FAIR, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today's discussion about attending college with food allergies. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few quick things. Please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees are going to be muted throughout the presentation. However, this is not going to stop you from joining in the conversation today. Everyone should see a Zoom toolbar in black at the bottom of your screen. In that toolbar, you will see a Q&A button. You can use this to communicate directly with our staff. Please let us know if you are having any technical difficulties and we'll do our best to help you out. But most importantly, you can use this feature to ask questions. Please feel free to send your questions our way throughout the presentation and we will incorporate as many as possible. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. First up, we have Sarah Ackerman. If you are active on social media, you may recognize her as the girl behind the hive. Sarah is currently pursuing her Master of Business Administration degree in New York. Next, we have Michael Mandanis, who is not only a rising junior in the Biological Engineering Department at MIT, but is the developer of an epinephrine temperature regulation pack called EpiTemp, which won him Fair's Young Innovator of the Year Award in 2017. And last, but certainly not least, we have Lois Reeves, whose passion for food allergy education led her to work with elementary schools in her hometown of Flint, Michigan to provide food allergy education to kids. Lois is a recent graduate from Central Michigan University with a bachelor's in music theater and is currently pursuing her second degree in communication. Thank you so much, Sarah, Michael, and Lois for joining us. And I know just to start right off the bat, I know we're gonna get a lot of COVID questions. Um, so just to clarify that all three of our presenters today are actually gonna be doing online classes this fall. Uh, so we're not going to talk a lot about COVID in college because it won't be something that they're going to be managing this semester. Another topic that we've received quite a few questions about in advance of the meeting was housing. So we're going to go ahead and start there. Um, so for all three of you, if you can think back to your freshman year of college, what was your living situation? Um, not only freshman year, but also later. Did you live in a dorm? Did you have roommates? How did things go with your housing? So I lived in a dorm for all four years of college um, during my undergraduate experience. So my freshman year, I did have a roommate. Uh, my sophomore year, I did not. And then my junior and senior year, I lived with sweet mates. And my sweet mates um, actually all agreed beforehand not to eat my allergens. And my suite was considered medical housing. So I got accommodations in order to live in that suite. And it was going to be allergen free. Um, and my sweet mates all had to agree. Freshman year, I had a great roommate who totally um, respected my allergens and never brought them into the room, and we never had any issues um, regarding that. So the biggest thing that I found with living with sweet mates or a roommate was to be straightforward from the beginning. It's kind of tough to lay down the rules and say, you know, I'm very strict about this, and that's your first impression, but it's so important. Um, I found from the beginning just to say very sternly that these rules are very serious and cannot be broken compared to starting in a, in a soft tone and trying to dial it up from there. Thank you, Sarah. Lois or Michael? Uh, yeah, I, I can go next. So uh, for me, the first few weeks of college were pretty rough. Um, I flew in by myself. I had two huge suitcases uh, and I had no idea what was going on. Uh, so I've lived in a dorm for my freshman and sophomore year and I was living in a dining hall dorm because that was what was recommended to me by the like the head of dining and the dietitian because it, uh, there are di dining hall dorms and cook for yourself dorms and cook for yourself dorms it's a lot harder to deal with like cross contact because there's a lot of other kids cooking. So I applied for a single room uh, initially but I didn't get it because my dorm ranks based on like a housing point system and my priority was pretty low in that. But first I ended up in a three person room. And that went pretty well at first. I contacted them ahead of time, and we agreed not to bring anything I was allergic to into the room. And we got it well, pretty well. Um, but unfortunately, it came up that one of my roommates got like almost all of his daily protein intake from peanut butter. Uh, so it was going to be pretty difficult for us to live together. So what happened was we ended up flipping a coin. And it was still during the period where you could switch rooms. So I switched out of the triple and into a quad. So I was living with three roommates my freshman year, uh, but I just had a same conversation with them. I just said, you know, I'm allergic to these things. It would be really helpful for me if you didn't bring anything that I was allergic to into the room. And they agreed. Uh, I also emailed like the resident advisor on the floor. So anytime there was food for like a study break on the floor, 
Uh, I would get to go into the RA's room and read like ingredients ahead of time, which was really helpful. So yeah, I think after like that bit of a rocky start, um, my freshman year situation turned out pretty well. I got along with my roommates well. Uh, at the end of the year, actually, it was kind of funny. One of my roommates found like a jar of mixed nuts, like buried deep in his closet. He would brought it from home on like the first day uh, and he had just never opened it because I was his roommate. So that was really nice. Um, other than that, I've lived in, uh, over the summer, I've lived in my frat house. So I'm part of fraternity. Uh, I lived with three roommates there as well. Uh, we had a similar kind of agreement. As long as you're just upfront about it, uh, as Sarah said, uh, it's really helpful. People will usually be pretty accommodating of you. Um, and yeah, I've lived with at least two roommates for all of my college experience. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Michael. And Lois, did you want to talk about your housing situation? Yes. So my freshman year, I was fortunate enough to be um, able to live in a suite that had four separate rooms on a first come first serve basis. So I was able to have my own living space and uh, within the first week talking to my roommates about all of my allergies and both of them, they did love peanut butter, <laughs> but they came to understand that for me, it wasn't airborne, but if I were to be in the room just out of respect to not have any peanut butter out or anything that I couldn't eat out. So they really became great about cleaning up after themselves anytime they had it. Uh, we had a little sink where you could do dishes. So they knew that if somebody had peanut butter on a dish, I the dishes were off limits for me. <laughs> um, so that was my, fr my freshman and sophomore year. My junior, senior year, I lived in an apartment with the same two girls. And that's where things kind of got rocky, really having to stand my ground and say, hey, I can't contribute to dishes if something is cleaned, like if something is um, cooked with peanut butter or any fish, any uh, shellfish, because they loved cooking that. And they became better about just letting me know if anything was cooked with any of those ingredients as I was out of the house most of the time due to my major. So it really just be became about respect and communication about when something was being cooked and if it had been cleaned prior to that, could I use it, was it okay? And honestly, the biggest advice is just communication from the very get-go. And as <laughs> the other panelists have said, really standing that ground and being firm from the get-go is a huge thing. Thank you so much. Um, and so I'm going to back up just a little bit because we got a question and I realized that I didn't ask you guys to address this to begin with. Um, they're asking what food allergies and restrictions each of you are managing. So if you don't mind, if you could just each of you give what, what you're avoiding so they have a sense of how that compares to their own situation. Sure. So I'm allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, soy, legumes, shellfish, and fish, um, and also some stone fruits, which go with the nuts. Uh, I also avoid gluten. And when I was in college, I was also allergic to chicken and dairy. Um, I no longer have those, but those are the ones that I was managing uh, in college. Thank you. Michael? Uh, I'm peanut, tree nut, and crustacean shellfish. Thank you. And then Lois? I'm allergic to all nuts, shellfish, fish, beef, and I have intolerances to egg, soy, and cocoa. Thank you. So you guys are managing quite a few between the three of you. So I think you have a pretty wide breadth of experience to share here. Um, so I heard you guys actually talking a little bit about cooking. Some of you talking about a little bit about cooking with your roommates and things. And one of the questions we actually got in advance was about the communal kitchens in residence halls. So if any of you guys had those in your residence halls, did you use them? Did you feel safe using them? Um, what would you sort of give advice to a, a high school student thinking about that? So I had a communal kitchen um, my freshman year, and then during my junior and senior year, again, I lived in a suite. But for all of the years that I did have access to a kitchen, I always had all of my own supplies. So I had a baking tray and a pot um, to boil water, or cook things, pan, forks, knives, etc. All of it, I had my own set. Um, I just felt safest when I was using my own. I kept it in my room, so I knew nobody else was using it. But um, the kitchen itself was kept pretty clean. and 
my freshman year, they actually had somebody who went through and cleaned the kitchen. That was one of the accommodations that um, I was able to get was to have somebody clean the kitchen daily. So that was um, a huge help. So I knew that the kitchen was being cleaned every day and I could sometimes time my meals um, after they came through to clean it. Um, but yes, having your own set of everything where you just know it's your safe food, I found to be really helpful when managing that uh, communal kitchen. Thank you. Michael or Lois, did either of you have something different you wanted to? Uh, yeah, so in the summer after my freshman year, I was living in my frat house with a bunch of roommates. And what we did is, so I've been learning how to cook since high school, just in case I needed to in college. So me and my roommates would go to like Costco and we would get a bunch of like basic ingredients that were safe for me. Uh, and then we would get home and we would cook them all together. Uh, I also had my own set of things, but um, occasionally we would have to use the stuff that was already present in the house. And when that happened, I just asked one of my roommates to like clean it beforehand, just like clean it with some soap and water. Uh, before we started cooking with it, and then we would dry it off, and then we would start cooking with that. Great advice. Thank you. Lois, did you want to add, or are you? Oh. Well, unfortunately for me, when I was in the dorms, our communal kitchen had a broken oven and stove, oh. so we didn't really get to use it much. <laughs> but um, once I got into my apartment, I think the toughest thing was just kind of at times having to backtrack if anything was used because there were some times where there was off communication. So something as simple as, hey, can I use the microwave or <laughs> can I use this pan or that pan or what has fish on it, what doesn't have fish on it. Mm -hmm. um, but it, for my own safety, sometimes I would go through and clean stuff even before I used it just to double check that everything was gonna be okay. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so switching gears a little bit outside of housing, we obviously dining is a huge deal for students with food allergies. Um, so were you guys able to successfully navigate the dining halls and eat on campus? And then following up from that, what were some of the things that you and the school did that either helped you succeed or made it challenging for you? So I had a bit of a mixed experience. Um, a lot of my allergens are within the top eight, but then I also have a number that are not covered by that. So the school I went to um, for undergraduate, which was Brandeis University, had a top eight free section of the dining hall. Um, so you could go into the separate room and they had a hot meal that was provided every day and also a refrigerator that had just some staples um, such as gluten-free bread and you know just different things that people might want um, daily. So that was extremely helpful. But there were a few issues uh, that rose during the you know, couple of years that I was um, eating there. And eventually I stopped being on the meal plan and only cooked for myself. Um, as aware as some schools are or you know, kitchens are of uh, food allergies, cross-contamination isn't always on everyone's radar. And that proved to be a huge issue. Um, so I eventually just you know, didn't feel safe eating there anymore. Um, so that that's how my my dining hall experience went. I never had luckily any you know major reaction, but it was just a comfort thing and also seeing some things the way that they were handled in the kitchen um, I wasn't comfortable with. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so when I was first applying to schools, I took a pretty proactive approach in trying to figure out like where I would be interested in what would be safe. Uh, like in sophomore year of high school, I emailed out to the heads of dining. Uh, and sort of like asked what their accommodations were. Uh, and then right before I applied in junior year, I actually emailed out again to reconfirm. And on top of that, when I visited schools, I always tried to set up a meeting with like the head of dining just to like make sure and see what was going on in person. And then when admissions decisions were released, I made plans to go to MIT's campus preview weekend. Um, and while I was there, I talked to the head of student disabilities and we arranged like a big meeting and stuff. And so there were like 10 people there from disability services, housing, dining. But after like a pretty long meeting, me and my family came away thinking like there wasn't a whole lot of like unique accommodations being made there, uh, which made my parents pretty nervous. But I decided to apply anyway and enroll because it was my dream school. It's somewhere that I've always wanted to go. And so for the first week on campus, I was living in a dining hall dorm. Um, and every time I would go to the dining hall, I would ask to see the dining manager. And then they would show me around and tell me exactly like what dishes I can and cannot eat. Uh, and during that time, they also introduced me to all of the, like the line chefs. And so over time, I just got to know them and they started recognizing me. So I would go in and they would preemptively tell me like, hey, you can eat this dish, you can't eat this dish. 
and I stopped talking to the dining manager after that uh, because I didn't need to. But um, throughout the semester, I would actually email the head of dining every so often to ask like questions or to give suggestions. Uh, a few of the suggestions are like ingredients at the point of service and online or like a special like dedicated pans for made to order stations and things like that. Um, and at one point during the semester, I got a sort of surprise email from him. Uh, and he said, we are thinking of instituting a top eight allergen free station in your dining hall. Uh, which was really cool because it was the first time MIT had anything like that. And so uh, it's called the Oasis Station. So I'll go there if I don't have time to talk to like the line chefs, but I try not to limit myself to eating from only there because uh, if there's another dish that I can eat, I will try to eat it. Uh, but it's still hard sometimes because uh, occasionally they'll serve something like a lobster and everybody gets the lobster. Mm -hmm. So uh, he gets kind of worried about like if there's residue left on the table because they're not cleaned like constantly. And so when that happens, uh, I have other stuff that I can do. I frequent a few like restaurants in the student center who know me very well and are able to accommodate me. And so I'll just go there if I don't feel comfortable leaving the dining hall. Um, that's kind of something I like to do. I like to frequent places so that they recognize me. <laughs> Good tip. <clears throat> and Lois? Uh, within my first week of being at my university, I contacted the dining hall manager and they had a dietitian in my dining hall as well. And I sat down with a meeting and talked to them about everything, all of my allergies, and they actually led me to this um, website we had online, and basically for the entire week at my university, you could see what every dining hall was serving and all the ingredients and everything that they had. So that was super helpful because, say, if where I lived at the dining hall had something that I needed to steer clear from, I could go to another dining hall where maybe everything was a safe option for me, and then from there, little things like figuring out if something was fried in a certain oil, I would just communicate with the different chefs that we had there. But the website definitely, that did made everything so much better for me. And they did have the one refrigerator with all of the allergen free um, items that people might want. But it ended up being a pretty safe environment for me to be in based on just that little website, which I've seen a lot of schools starting to implement, which is a great thing. Yeah, that's definitely becoming more common. And I think I'm hearing a common theme here from all of you, which is communication, communication, communication is so key and both ways. So you guys to them and also them to you providing that information. Um, we do have a dietitian who is attending right now and is working on setting up a, a pantry, food allergy pantry slash like grab and go area on her campus. And she asked if any of you guys have recommendations for like specific products that you think would be really great to keep on a college campus for students with food allergies? So in the refrigerators in my um, dining hall at school, something that kind of made it a little bit special was that they were able to provide um, top eight allergen-free brownies and cookies that were pre-packaged and had all the ingredients and manufacturing information. But normally, um, I'm sure <laughs> the panelists will agree, a lot of times you feel left out in a bad way with food allergies where you don't get to eat the fun snacks. So having these cookies and brownies you know, available every day that people were jealous of was kind of a nice little perk that made you feel a little bit less like, okay, I still get something good that's safe for me. Um, and, you know, you could bring it back to your room and all that. But definitely prepackaged um, is what I recommend. A lot of times I would find there would be an open loaf of bread, but then I wouldn't feel comfortable taking a piece out of it because I don't know who's going into the refrigerator, you know, all day. And yes, it could be someone with food allergies, but maybe it's somebody who just, you know, doesn't like what they're serving that day. Um, so everything just individually wrapped, uh, that would definitely be my, my number one suggestion suggestion to make people feel comfortable and safe. Thank you. Michael? I'm not sponsored, but I like Enjoy Life products. <laughs> uh, yeah, Perfect. yeah, they're, they're, uh, yeah, they're top eight free. It's, it's great. Awesome. Thank you. And Lois? Um, various types of milk. I know that was something I ran into because even though I'm not dairy free, I like to make sure that 80% of my diet isn't dairy. So, um, something like rice milk or oat milk, especially for people who can't have almond milk is a huge thing. Great, thank you. Um, and I will reiterate too with the dessert items, that is always a huge hot button issue on campuses because of course bakeries are full of so many things that people can't have and flour is very airborne. Um, so those prepackaged desserts are something that I hear all the time that students would really like to have access to. So I think that's a nice perk. Um, 
So moving a little bit beyond dining and housing, a big question that often comes up is around classroom accommodations once you get to college. And it's a little bit different. You know, you guys are adults now, so it's not quite the same as when you were younger, younger kids. Um, but have any of you guys ever needed academic accommodations for food allergy? And thinking about some of the more common ways I hear about that are maybe your allergen is being used in the class. This comes up a lot for culinary students or science students. Um, or maybe you had to miss a class because of a reaction. So have you guys ever gone through the process of setting those up? Yes. So I had accommodations all through, you know, elementary, middle, high school um, with a 504 plan to, so teachers understood that if I had an allergic reaction, I had to leave the classroom, miss class, et cetera. But in college, um, I did not have that in place initially. And I had my first reaction where I had to administer my own AVIQ the day before a final um, in one of my classes. So that was definitely stressful and I'm sitting in the hospital freaking out about my final um, and my mom <laughs> came to come be with me in the hospital and she said, you do not need to worry about this. This isn't even an issue. And I was so nervous to email my professor, but then th once I got the response, the thing I realized is that they're people too. You always think of your professor as somebody who's so scary. And in that case, I was terrified of him in class and, you know, yeah, this scary reputation, but he totally understood. Um, I pushed the final off for a week um, and, you know, while I recovered and kind of just got everything back under control and they are people. So I would definitely recommend sharing with your professors if something comes up exactly what happened. And I think that they'll be more understanding than if you say on a Friday morning class, oh, I'm sick today, you know? Um, so I just, I think being open about your food allergies um, has definitely helped me with accommodations and getting people to understand um, exactly what I need. Awesome. Thank you. Michael? So luckily, I really haven't had that issue with like in-class events very much, but there have been some like academic related activities that have involved food and stuff outside of class. Uh, and so when that happens, I usually just try to talk to like whoever's providing the food and like uh, email them and talk to them ahead of time. Because uh, in my major, occasionally we'll have big like meal events with both the faculty and the students. Um, so whenever that happens, I email the head of undergraduate programming and she's really nice. She's usually super willing to help me like prepare a separate safe meal that would be safe for me or that uh, to get me in contact directly with the caterers. Uh, and it's the same with other like, with, like leadership seminars or like formal events. It's usually a lot of just like, I try to contact the person ahead of time. And then I also, when I get there in person, I try to talk to like the head chef and confirm like, hey, can I eat this thing? Um, and in cases where I don't think that, uh, I'm not sure whether or not something will be safe, I just eat ahead of time. Thank you. Lois, did you have anything to add? Uh, yes. So for my major, it was a huge, um, well, semester a semester thing where we would always get together with whoever our voice teacher was and everybody would have like a huge food party. So I definitely, <laughs> I would t talk to my teacher about that and they would ensure that everything that everybody brought was not going to interfere with any of my allergens. Um, the one time I did have an allergic reaction my senior year, it was of course the day of a choir concert. So I immediately emailed my teacher and even contacted a couple students in case he wasn't reading his emails that day, just to let him know everything that was going on and keeping him up to date on every update that I got. And he ended up being very accommodating about it. Just as Sarah said, there are professor, our professors are human. Uh, they only want the best for us. And so all I had to do was talk to him about it. He was completely understanding. They didn't make me do any extra work because I had done the work in class already. That's great. So it sounds like you guys have had some really supportive professors, which is excellent. Um, and I know that's not always the case. So of course, like you said, professors are human. So a lot of them are really wonderful and um, really supportive, but sometimes people run into difficult ones. Have any of you guys ever had any sort of conflict or difficulty with a professor or has it mostly been smooth sailing? I have. Um, there was a class where a student would bring a jar of peanut butter and a spoon every week to class. Um, and at first I, you know, obviously I freaked out the first day that I walked in and saw this happening and I was an 
um, you know, a sophomore in an upper level class. So I was scared of the senior who was eating the peanut butter. Um, so my first approach was to go to the professor and talk to him because technically you were not supposed to eat in class anyway, but you know how those rules uh, often bend. But the professor was not accommodating at all. And what ended up happening was that I got to that class early uh, a couple weeks later, stood outside and waited for this person to walk into the room. And I confronted him and not in the, you know, mean way or anything, but just letting him know I had food allergy and was there any possible way that he could eat his peanut butter before he walked into the classroom or just after class, whatever. Um, and he was totally fine and understood everything, but the professor was absolutely not helpful and said that he couldn't Oh. stop anyone from eating what they wanted about how it was lunchtime hour class but uh the student himself was <laughs> was okay so i was able to get through that but there have been some tough situations definitely that have come up yeah i'm glad that the student worked with you at least on that one anyone else no okay um so you just addressed this actually sarah but my next question is specifically about uh, navigating if people are bringing your allergens into the classroom so and this question actually came from a professor who is very careful about making sure that food isn't in his classroom so he's accommodating allergies but he wanted to know how you navigate when your classmates do bring those in so sarah we already heard from you but michael or lois has that situation come up for either of you uh so I haven't really had to deal with that in like the classroom very much because I try to sit next to people that I know and all of my friends are like very aware of my food allergies. But uh, in cases where it's not possible, I understand that that's, uh, that does happen. Um, I haven't had to deal with it like in the classroom, but I have had to deal with that like outside of the classroom, like on an airplane, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, if I notice someone eating something that I'm allergic to, uh, usually I'll just sort of strike up a conversation with them and say, hey, I am allergic to this thing. Would you be willing to eat this after class or like later or when we're off the plane? Uh, and usually people are pretty receptive to that if you just sort of explain like, oh, it's, it's dangerous, uh, please don't. Yeah, awesome. Lois? I've had similar experiences, um, not in the classroom, but being in theater, we usually have like a community room where everybody will sit in between classes. It's not mandated by one professor, but it's just, um, only for this department. And typically in that scenario, I would do just as Michael said, I would strike up a conversation with them and say, um, I'm allergic to this. Is, is there any way you can eat it outside of the green room while I'm in here? Or possibly just wait until after I'm, I'm gone <laughs> for a while or gone to class for a while. Mm -hmm. And typically everybody would be pretty receptive about it, even to the point of like, there were times where somebody else would pull out something like a peanut butter snack or whatever. and somebody else would actually say something before I had the chance to. So it, it's all, again, all about talking to people. Most of the time, they're pretty receptive to it. That's great. So someone else is stepping up and standing up for you too, which I hope that everybody gets that situation where they end up with other champions. So they don't always have to be the one asking their classmates not to do something. Um, switching gears again a little bit because huge topic in college and it's not specifically college um, or campus but social life social life is such a huge part of of college living um, so as you guys think about and it sounds like you guys are pretty open and really good about communicate communicating about how open are you about your food allergies with friends roommates dates um, dates particularly because i think that conversation can be a little bit challenging and how do you begin those conversations so it sort of varies depending on who I'm speaking with. Um, initially, when I was in school, you know, my closest friends all knew, but then I joined a sorority and eventually um, became president of the sorority. So by the time I was president, I felt very comfortable speaking out to this group of girls and just made it very clear, like, you cannot bring this type of food into our sorority meetings. It was kind of a joke that everyone would have, you know, their cups of Starbucks drinks all sitting in a pile outside the door. Um, but it's just, you know, surrounding yourself with good people. Like Lois said, you know, you have these friends who are even willing to speak up for you before you get the chance to. And that's something I really found in college. I think, you know, by going away to school and being able to sort of 
navigate it myself, I was able to find the, the people who were willing to speak up and help me with those situations. Um, but dating is a little bit different. <laughs> so that is definitely uh, a bit of a challenge to say the least. It's a very weird situation. Um, I have talked about it a lot, my experiences with dating with food allergies, but um, you know, something I've said before is that when you're leaning in for a kiss, you don't want to be like, hey, what'd you eat today? Um, so that is, is a difficult conversation that unfortunately needs to be done right away. And again, it's like when you get to school, setting those boundaries and your strict rules with your roommate. Same thing when you're in a relationship saying you cannot eat this if you plan on seeing me today. If you eat this, you can't see me. So it's, it's pretty, you know, straightforward. And of course, there are mistakes in dating, you know, where people slip up, but it's just going through that and using it as a learning experience um, so that you can teach your significant other. It's like they're getting diagnosed with a food allergy and have to learn it all, you know, in the course of a few weeks um, initially. So that's, uh, that's what, I, what I think about that. <laughs> Good point. Plus, you know, those conversations are awkward, but also really awkward would be ending up in the emergency room on your first right. day if you didn't have that conversation. Yes, um, exactly. So you, you, weigh, you weigh it out and you know what, it's better to have the awkward conversation than the emergency room visit. So yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> it would be memorable, I guess, but not, <laughs> yeah. not in the way you want. Exactly. Um, Michael, did you have anything to add to that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm very open about my food allergies with basically like anyone I interact with. Uh, all my roommates know how to use epinephrine injectors. Uh, I've trained them in that, uh, and then like even like people I date, I bring it up pretty early on. Um, so I, I actually have a strategy for this. So my strategy is when I invite someone out on a date, I'll try to invite them out to a restaurant that I know really well that I can eat at, uh, and then I'll ask to talk to the manager to talk about my food allergies, and then I'll bring it up with my date. Uh, and if we end up like hitting it off, I'll explain to them, hey, uh, if you've eaten something that I'm allergic to, or if you eat something that I'm allergic to, uh, it could be pretty dangerous for me. And uh, I've even sent people I've dated like an article with like the guidelines on how long you have to wait after eating an allergen before you can like kiss. And that is only as awkward as you let it be. And I let it be very awkward because it's pretty hard to do otherwise. Uh, it's just kind of something you have to do. But um, I'm also involved in like student group musical theater. Uh, and so like there are situations where you have to like kiss on stage and when that happens, it's, you just got to treat it like it's a relationship. You got to be upfront about it. You got to say, don't eat these things on days when we practice, please. Uh, and over time you build up like trust and you build like a rapport, just like with a real relationship and it becomes easier over time. Thank you. And Lois? Yes, I've had very similar experiences to Michael, especially with theater, um, having seen partners right off the bat, letting them know, hey, I cannot eat these. Like, I am allergic to these um, allergens. Please do not come in contact with them before we practice, if, like, at all. And if you have, please let me know. Don't try to cover it up and hide it, because I will know. <laughs> um, I know for me, everywhere I go, from the time I was a child, my mom always taught me to carry a purse with my with everything I need, my Benadryl, my inhaler, my EpiPen, everything. So anywhere that I go, I would have that. All my friends would know where that is for me. And as far as like going on a date, I would always try to do a little a similar thing to Michael where the first place I would take them or I would bring up would say, hey, let's go out to eat. And then before we pick a place, I'm like, these are my allergens. So let's pick a place where I can have some, like actually have a meal and not just it with a salad that I don't really want <laughs> but I would say that for me as far as like any tactics or things that I use that's usually that's my go-to awesome thank you guys those are some good tips um, a little bit of a follow-up from that which is someone is asking when they have disclosed their food allergies in the past they've been subject to either some bullying or people thinking it's a joke and kind of laughing at it so have you guys ever experienced either of that, people not taking it seriously and just thinking it's funny or people deliberately going out of their way to be bullying um, and put you in danger? And if so, how did you, how did you manage that situation? So yes, um, is the short answer. I have definitely been, you know, targeted or bullied because of my food allergies. Um, that did mostly happen in, you know, middle and high school. And luckily I didn't really deal with that in college. In college, it was more a lack of understanding and then having to, you know, educate um, or pick my battles, essentially, if it was somebody I was going to be interacting with a lot, um, and really sit down and kind of explain everything and use a lot of, you know, 
bears resources and say, look, you can read all about it. This is why it's so serious and how it affects um, every part of my life and it is life threatening. But it's, it's tricky sometimes because there are certain people who are willing to listen and others who aren't. And again, in college, there are a lot of people out there and I found, you know, some friendships last and some don't. And all of my good friends, they were able to, you know, accommodate my allergies and really respect that. And it never, there was never an uncomfortable situation. Sure, in the moment, it felt a little bit awkward um, at times if we were picking restaurants or explaining things, but then it just quickly passes and, you know, they, they understand and they want you to be with them. It's more important that the person is there than the food. So uh, that's the biggest thing, you know, that I've kept in mind. Thank you, Sarah. Michael? Uh, yeah, so for me, I've also, uh, m times when people were sort of, uh, didn't understand like the severity of food allergies or made fun of me for it, that was more of like a middle school thing for me. Uh, but going to college, people are a lot more mature, at least in my experience. And so especially, I'm a part of a frat, uh, and my, my brothers, we've been on like road trips together and stuff. And there have been times on both times, we've been to like New York and Cape Cod, um, when we sat down at a restaurant, I talked to the manager, and I realized, I don't think I'm comfortable eating here. Uh, and at that point, you know, I, I don't want to be like a bother to people. So I'll offer, hey, uh, go ahead and order here. I'll grab some McDonald's on the way back uh, to our hotel and it'll be fine. Uh, but th at the same time, my friends sort of all got up and they said, no, let's go somewhere you can feel comfortable eating. And so I think it's really important to build that community around yourself, people who are very understanding, uh, people who are like accommodating. And if someone does like, if, if someone does have like misconceptions, Exceptions about food allergies. Um, I think it's important to sort of explain to them, like, "Yo, no, I could die. Please don't. Uh, that is a bad thing." Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Lois. For me in college, I haven't really faced any serious bullying or harassment about it. I would typically get the occasional joke, like, "Oh, I'm going to stick you with your epipen," to which I would, <laughs> the tactic I would use would go into detail about what would happen if they, if I would need to use my EpiPen and just tell them about past experiences, because once they hear those stories, they realize how real this is for me and everybody who suffers from allergies this severe. So I found that using that really got people to simmer down and understand that it's not a joke. Mm -hmm. But um, other than that, I never really, in college, I found more people that were more understanding and more compassionate about allergies than anything, which was a blessing to have. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I think the sort of common theme that I'm hearing here too is, you know, you get to pick your friends in college. So if someone's not going to be supportive, if they are going to bully you or threaten you, they're not a good friend, they're not a good date. You're like, do you really, do you really want to hang out with the person who's awful to you? So find, find those people who will be your champions, find those people who will be supportive friends and, and make them your tribe. Um, so still on the topic of social, and we are getting tons and tons of follow-ups here um, to, your, to your various situations, how do you guys manage going out and being social, knowing that events are going to have food, um, going to restaurants? I heard, Michael, you talked a little bit about this, but if you know social events are going to involve food, and they so often do, how do you sort of plan for that and prepare for that in advance? I think Sarah might be frozen right now. So Michael, if you want to start us off. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, tip number one for going out to social events, keep your epinephrine on you. Uh, I always have like a backpack uh, that I have. I have like several tiny little like crossbody bags uh, for different styles to go with like different outfits or whatever. And so yeah, always have your epinephrine on you no matter what, because that'll really help with like your peace of mind when going out. And it's also just a very good idea to have it on you. Um, <clears throat> if for me, going out involves a lot of planning ahead. So if I know someone who's going to be hosting an event, I will call or text them ahead of time and ask them where the food's going to be coming from. If we're going out to a restaurant or we're ordering something out, uh, I'll call that restaurant like ahead of time uh, and see if I can eat there. But if it's like a person bringing the food, I will try to get in contact with that person directly and ask them what's going to be there. Um, in the event that I end up somewhere where I don't know or I don't know who to ask or I'm not comfortable eating, I also always keep like safe snacks in my backpack uh, just in case like I get somewhere and I'm like, oh, I don't really want to eat this stuff, so I'll just eat this. But yeah, at, at the same time, it's about like, uh, like I mentioned before, it's about like building that community that is supportive of you. So 
when I rushed my frat freshman year, I got really injured during rush by, uh, uh, we were, we were at like sky zone. So I was like, uh, jumping off a trampoline and I really messed up my leg. Uh, so I was on crutches for the first month of school, but the people there were really nice. And they even like brought me food after they confirmed it was from like a restaurant that I could eat at. And so, yeah, after I joined my frat, I just had to like explain it to the people. Uh, of my frat and all the brothers and anytime we had a house event or a house dinner and I was going to be there they said that they would be able to make sure the food was safe so it's about being up front and trying to plan ahead I think for going out. Awesome. Thank you and Lois? Well as Michael said always 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 keep anything that you need with you in a bag um, and even say if you're going to like a sports event and they try to say oh you can't bring a bag with you most of the time, if you explain to them that you need it for medical reasons, they will let you bring that bag in. So don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't take a bag with you if you absolutely need it. Um, as far as going to like friends' houses and everything, for me, out of comfortability, I would always eat beforehand. I would explain my allergies to everybody, of course, but then if I just, if it came down to it that I was not comfortable, I would always have food and I would explain to them when I got there that I had already, that I had eaten so that it was okay because a lot of the time, I don't know why for people it's hard not to eat beef. So <laughs> that was just something that I always did. And then as far as going out to eat, um, most of the time they would even let me pick the restaurant that we would go to just because it was way easier that way than trying to go through and having to call all these different places and look at their menus. And then even sometimes getting there and realizing that's something I thought I could have would actually be cross-contaminated and then having that awkward moment with everybody like do we eat here do we not eat here so um yeah those are just a few things that I did when I was with all my friends awesome thank you I'm I mean, so sorry about that oh, I was just gonna I'm say I think Sarah's back so. yes I'm in New York and the storm is coming and we lost power so it's back now luckily but um yes that's that's what I, I don't know if you that. heard that question before you uh froze and dipped out but a lot of people <laughs> asking questions about how you sort of prepare in advance knowing that so many social situations involve food so how do you prepare and attend those safely Sure. So when I got to school, I quickly established a relationship with the dining hall manager, supervisors, and also the dietitian um, at the school. So then when uh, the school that I went to, we had a lot of big community events. And so there were a lot of events that were catered um, by the university. So I would always reach out a day or two before just to see what their menu was and likely knowing that I wasn't going to eat, especially when it was buffet style, which likely will not be occurring anymore <laughs> due to COVID. Um, but I would just want to know, you know, exactly what I was going to be surrounded by and if there were things that I needed to avoid. My school um, and, you know, I've noticed and heard from a lot of people that a lot of other schools are becoming pretty nut aware. And for the most part, um, that allergy wasn't particularly, particularly an issue when I was eating at those community events. So that was nice for me because peanuts and nuts are my airborne allergens. Um, but it was trickier to avoid things like gluten. And I would just, you know, carry that. Oh. and um, just, you know, put a couple snacks in there if I was going to get hungry um, during the event. But for the most part, I, I wouldn't really eat, um, but know that I could be there again, which is the important part of it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and sort of a follow-up to this, and, and I completely and wholeheartedly agree with this comment, which is someone is saying, you guys are all such responsible young adults. Um, so what really helped you transition into becoming such a responsible adult, taking on responsibility for your own food allergies um, and self-advocating for yourself in college? I would say going to college. Um, before I left for school, it was definitely my parents who were doing the advocating. And if there was an issue, I would tell my parents and they would kind of handle it. But once I went to school, of course, they were only a phone call away, but I was on my own. So it was definitely a, a quick learning experience, but I'm so grateful for it. And, you know, again, I had that anaphylactic reaction where I had to use my AviQ and being able to administer it to myself was really my turning point of, okay, I've got this, you know, I'm able to do this. I've always been terrified of what happens if, and now I know what the answer is. Um, and just, you know, having to deal with those situations where you're surrounded by friends, of course, and people who love and care about you, but it's, a, it's different than being next to your parents all the time. So that's definitely uh, going to college is what did it for me. Michael? Uh, for me, it actually started a bit in high school. My parents wanted me to start becoming more like independent uh, and to like advocate for myself. 
And so they would like, whenever we went to a restaurant, they'd be like, uh, we're not gonna call them and ask ahead, that's your job. Uh, and so doing that early on really helped me practice for going into college. But once you're actually like away from home, it is a pretty big shift. It's like being thrown into the deep end of a swimming pool where you just have to, you have to learn to sink or swim. You have to adapt. You have to think about things that you didn't really have to think about before. Like, uh, for example, like there are times when the dining hall has been closed. So I've had to like just go out and get food to like prepare for meal prep and stuff. And that's like not something that I've had to think about before college. And so I think what Sarah said, just going to college and being forced to adapt to all these different situations is really the best catalyst for becoming better at it. Awesome, thank you. Lois? Uh, for me, it really started when I was a child. My mom always instilled in me that I had to be my biggest advocate. So then when I got to college, it just felt like a second nature. Of course, there's that whole aspect of being independent for the first time in your life, but um, just knowing as a child what I could eat and thinking back to, okay, what did I have at home if I couldn't go to the dining hall or what would I do? And at the end of the day, always had to resort to a salad at times. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and I would say to reiterating to everyone and especially for all of the teens that are listening, the sooner you start practicing those skills, it will be totally different in college. But if you can start practicing those skills earlier, like ordering for yourself at restaurants, making sure you're responsible with your epinephrine, making sure that you're starting those conversations with friends young, um, it'll just feel a little bit easier, I think, when you get to that college space. So still in the social life, um, we got a ton of questions about alcohol. So of course, many people turn 21 in college. Um, let's pretend nobody drinks before they're 21, but they're turning 21 in college. Do you guys have any tips related to alcohol and food allergies and how you guys have managed that? So um, for my school, a lot of the parties were on campus or in off campus housing. It wasn't really so much going out to bars. Um, so I found the biggest thing was to just bring my own drink. So a lot of the big frat mixes are, you know, all different alcohols and juices mixed together. And I can't have a lot of alcohol because of allergies, but also a lot of fruit. So um, I really just avoided the, any of the communal drinks and always made sure to bring my own. Um, but I'll mention something that happened um, when I was in college, which is there was a boy on my hall who was very drunk um, and I knew that he had a nut allergy because he shared that early in the semester. And there was a night that we all kind of came back to the dorm and we were all in the common room and I immediately recognized that he was having an anaphylactic reaction. And he was terrified. All these people on the hall, including him, were screaming at me not to do anything about it because he was scared because he was underage and he was drunk. And, you know, we didn't know what to do. They were all yelling at me and I said, no, I recognize this and I'm calling 911. And I did, um, even my RA, not the best, you know, thing to do, but she was saying, oh, I think he'll be fine. Just, you know, sleep it off. Um, the paramedics came and they told me that I literally saved his life. And the thing to know in that situation is, yes, you are underage and you were drinking, but an anaphylactic reaction is so much scarier, has much longer lasting effects and just needs to be handled in that situation. And, you know, there were times that I was a little bit drunk or something and I was like, oh, does something feel wrong or am I having an allergic reaction? And I wasn't luckily, but knowing that if I was, I was going to properly handle it is so important. And you, you can't be scared of that component if you are drinking and need to know, you know, I have to do what I must do in order to stay safe with my food allergies. Good advice. Thank you. Michael? Uh, so I, uh, I'm 19, so I don't drink. Um, uh, that being said, I don't really plan on drinking, even when I turn 21. Uh, I just don't really want to put myself in a situation where I might accidentally expose myself to something I'm allergic to. That's just something that I've made, a decision I've made for myself. Uh, I am a frat brother, so I do go to a lot of, like, frat parties where people are drinking. And a piece of advice I have is that you don't have to drink to enjoy a party as long as you either enjoy dancing or you just want to watch other people do really entertaining stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's my advice. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and just to really quickly follow up on something that Michael said there about avoiding allergen, another thing to know is that a lot of alcohol is actually exempt from labeling laws. So if you do have an allergen in the top eight, and you're used to being able to look at a label and see it contains walnuts, it contains shrimp, the alcohol may not 
actually have that. So just be aware of that as well. Um, and Lois, did you have anything to add? Yes. Um, the first thing, to, the first tip I have is to do extensive research, looking into, if you can, what ingredients they have. That was one thing that I did before I ever started drinking, was really looking to make sure that I was not going to be accidentally exposing myself to anything. Mm -hmm. um, always, always look something up, especially like if your friends offer you something, don't just immediately take it. Um, I had an, an almost incident where a friend of mine offered me a drink that they had. And when I asked what was in it, they said amaretto. And I didn't know what that was. I looked it up and it was an almond liquor. So had I taken that, that would have been a sure way to the hospital for me. Um, but definitely doing all of your research that you can. And if you're somebody that uses Benadryl, if you're exposed to maybe an intolerance or something that isn't severe, do not drink with Benadryl because they are both, they will both make you drowsy and it will only heighten the effects of the alcohol. So steer clear of both of those. And that's all I got. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to have stepped on you a little bit there with the ingredient information. Um, so we got quite a few questions actually also dealing a little bit with anxiety. So I don't know if anxiety around your food allergies is something that you guys have dealt with, but if it is, how have you managed that? And obviously you guys are all so outspoken um, and you're really clearly some of the best self-advocators that I've ever met. Um, but if you have had to tackle that anxiety issue, how have you sort of managed that? So I definitely have dealt with food allergy anxiety. Um, and a big part of that was after I had an anaphylactic reaction, um, just learning to feel comfortable and safe again, because I, in my eyes, did all the right things. But of course, accidents happen. And that's what happened in that case. Um, so it was hard. And it was especially hard being away at school where I was the only one, you know, seeing that I was eating every day. And I definitely wasn't eating what I was supposed to. So it wasn't until I came home for um, winter break that my parents saw that my portions and, you know, things I was eating and my reactions um, just, you know, psychologically after eating anything were so off that they kind of stepped in. And the biggest thing that um, helped me in that situation was something my allergist said, which was, if you're having an allergic reaction, it's going to come through no matter what. So just because I'm not sitting there thinking about it doesn't mean it's not going to show itself. So, you know, whether I'm doing something fun or just sitting and waiting for something bad to happen, it's going to happen, um, you know, either way. So that was a big thing. And then what sort of helped me to kind of get through it was to have something lined up right after I was eating. So if I was eating lunch and then knew, okay, now I'm going to hang out with my friends. It was those 30 minutes after I finished eating where I just needed to keep my mind busy. Um, and, you know, my, my parents helped me with that one um, to learn to do that. But that's really, you know, still um, with COVID, there's a lot of anxieties that come back in people. And sometimes I'll find myself, okay, I know that if I eat right now, I need to find something to do. Um, but that's, that's definitely my, my biggest tip for managing that. Awesome. Thank you. Michael or Lois? <laughs> I used to be very, I used to get very anxious when it came to like uh, thinking if there was like food residue on like door handles or things like that. Uh, so like the second I got back to my dorm room, uh, I would like clean off like what I brought with me that day, like the, my phone, I would like clean off my like laptop and things like that. Um, I guess just over time, I just realized that uh, it just sort of like calmed down because when something is like that, as long as you're like washing your hands regularly, uh, I, I feel like that really helped me a lot dealing with like the anxiety there. Uh, so I eventually just sort of s calmed down, I guess. Uh, I don't, I don't really have a, a good insight into myself as to how, but just over time it, it improved. I guess just being in like a, an, an environment where you have to constantly think about that. Mm -hmm. Um, it either gets like relegated to like somewhere in the back of your mind or something like that. But yeah, as long as you're being careful, making sure you're washing your hands regularly before you eat and things like that. Um, I think that does help with anxiety. A bit. Good to know. And I think just as a little bit of a follow up to that and like a small, tiny silver lining of COVID is that everyone is very, very aware of hand washing and cleanliness and separation and distance right now. So perhaps that helps in this scenario, knowing that other people are also washing their hands probably more than they used to. Um, Lois, did you want to add anything? Uh, most of my anxieties come from going out to eat and different social gatherings where there's a lot of food. Mm -hmm. So anytime before I would go, or if 
I didn't have a close friend that was going to be there, I would bring one with me. And I would explain to them the anxieties that I felt because a lot of them really come from when somebody pushes me to eat something or somebody is pushing me for answers as to like why I can't eat something that they might have prepared. So really having that friend there kind of like for the support, but also things get too intense just to like tell the other person to back off because it's not really something that you have, that you're entitled to explain. Like you, you don't have to explain because you know that you can't eat something for your own safety. So really having somebody there to help you stand your ground because sometimes it can be hard to stand it on your own. Yeah, good tip. Um, so we are almost out of time. I feel like that went really quickly. You guys have so much awesome information to share. I'm gonna end with one last question. And Michael, um, I know you have a big presentation next, which we are all sending you so much good luck for. Uh, so we're gonna start with you so you can drop off right after this. Uh, so what would be sort of your big piece of advice or tip that you would give to high school students and their families as they're preparing for that transition to college? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's very important to consider your food allergies when you're deciding on like a place or like a school that you want to go. But I don't think you should let them define you or let, force you into a specific choice. Um, they should be a big part of your decision. There's no doubt about that. But it's also really important to consider other aspects of campus life, like uh, student groups that you want to be a part of, uh, what kind of academics they have, or even just like the social atmosphere of a campus. So it's important to be proactive and to learn as much as you can about the school you want to go to and to ask questions. And once you get there, you shouldn't let your food allergies prevent you from trying new things. Like, you should be able to try new activities, and that'll help you meet new people. And those new people might be really supportive of you, and they'll be there for you when you need them to. Because there are always going to be like, surprises and obstacles in life. Um, and you just have to trust in yourself that you know how to handle those and that you have what it takes to deal with those problems. Um, and lastly, uh, just don't forget to call home. Uh, your parents, uh, especially parents of food allergy kids, get really worried. Um, but with that, yeah, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, good luck to all of you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and good luck with your presentation. Lois, did you want to go next? Sure. Um, my biggest advice, especially for once you get to college, is stay diligent. Be aware of everything around you. Really be your own self-advocate, but don't let that get in the way of you enjoying this experience because there's so much that college has to offer. And just as Michael said, your allergies do not define you. And college is such an important time for you to form your identity and decide who do you wanna be? So definitely keep everything into consideration, stay safe, but also have fun. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Sarah? So I would say to trust your gut. Um, a lot of food allergy kids, including myself, have that voice in the back of your head that just is kind of telling you, okay, you know you want to eat that cookie, but is it really safe? And always just kind of going with that and knowing that you know yourself best. Um, like Lois said, being a big self-advocate, looking out for yourself. I was terrified to go to college. That was the first time I ever left home. I was always super scared, never did sleepaway camp or anything like that. And you know, I did it. Um, and there were hard days and just kind of trusting myself, knowing that I had the support of my friends, my parents to just kind of help me get through it. If I did face a situation because they did come up sometimes, um, that was huge. And I love sharing my experiences. So I see there are a million questions that people have sent in. So if anyone wants to reach out to me at all, um, uh, Instagram and Facebook that Christy mentioned earlier, girl behind the high, feel free to message me. I'm happy to talk to you. But you got this. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And I think if it brings anybody any comfort, especially for the parents um, and also for, for you kids who are joining, is seeing that it can be done. Michael, Lois, and Sarah, you guys are crushing it. You have crushed it. Um, you're all very successful young adults. So thank you so much for coming and being such an inspiration. Um, one other quick note, because I did see a ton of questions come in about the kissing study that Michael mentioned. If you go to foodallergy.org and you search in the search bar for kissing, you'll get to a page that will talk about that study and what it showed and what steps you should take to avoid a reaction after someone's consumed your allergen. Um, so, and a copy of this Q&A will be available at foodallergy.org slash webinars in about seven to 10 days. So if you missed anything, want to rewatch it, want to share it with someone else in your family who didn't attend, check there um, in just about a week or two. So with that, I will let everyone go. Thank you again so much for everyone for joining us and to our awesome presenters uh, and have a great rest of your day.